Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. <laughs> Don't we sound calm? We are calm. We're not calm. Yes, we're, we're excited. <laughs> Russ has his t-shirt on. This is what else could possibly <coughs> go right. It's going to be a good day. I told him to be ready for all the questions. Hi, Lakeisha. Thanks for the love note you just sent. And I was really sleepy when we went down to breakfast this morning <laughs> here in Baltimore, Maryland at the Hilton Garden Inn and uh, ministering again tonight at the Restoration Temple. We've been doing a series of teachings that have been somewhat based on what we've been teaching here in Morning Light through Ezekiel chapter 40 through 47 and now chapter 48. Some really awesome words Mm -hmm. coming forth in such a receptive congregation at Restoration Temple with our host, Apostle Gene Donnell. And then we will be uh, having a few days after this, a few days diversion after our last meeting Sunday morning here, and then moving on to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where we'll be ministering at Fire Hall with our hosts, uh, Kristen and Scott Stoll and Jonas Jonas Stoltz and his family. So we're looking forward to what God has Mm -hmm. for us as we've now passed the halfway mark in the Come Up Higher Tour. Mm -hmm. Tonight we're ministering. I feel led, unless the Lord tells me otherwise, to minister on something. You've heard me talk about it many times in Morning Light about the throne room experience in the beginning of Revelation where John sees the four living creatures and the 24 elders, Mm -hmm. if the Lord lets me do it. And it's all about Christ in your heart, that your heart has four chambers, corresponds to the four living creatures. Mm -hmm. And there are 24 ribs encasing your heart, representing the 24 elders. And that whole picture of Revelation can be internalized by emphasis, not by exclusion. Because people say, well, it's not about that. Well, it's about many things. It's the manifold wisdom of God. And if the Lord allows me to do it, I'm going to put that together uh, tonight. And uh, as the third and final installment of a series called the Restoration Temple Series. Awesome, awesome word Mm -hmm. that we shared last night about waters to swim in. Somewhat based on what we taught yesterday. And we'll be putting it out on audio Uh, sometime after we complete after tonight. Today is uh, Friday, and you know what day that is. It's Giving Day. We didn't talk about this last Friday. I was really excited to get into the teaching and uh, forgot to bring that up. But we have every Friday, uh, almost without fail, we give away a a Giving Day download, and we post it out on social media. It's on our website as well. And you you have heard me in the morning light talking about a book by, by an author by the name of Robert Fogel about the fourth, coming Fourth Great Awakening. Now, Fogel did not write as a uh, Christian speaking from inspiration, but he wrote as a Nobel Prize winning economist looking at patterns in history and suggesting that all economic uh, high points and societal high points in our culture, in the Western world, for the last 200 years plus, have always been preceded by a great awakening. And he identifies patterns connecting economic and social advancement with spiritual revival. And he won the Nobel Prize for doing it. And so I extracted some of Fogel's uh, points and observations and put them in a teaching and released it in this download that we preached in Sterling, Virginia, just a few days ago. So it's it's something that's brand new. And again, you've heard me talk about it, but I put it together in a concise uh, article of which I will be releasing the video. I have the video, and I just have to have time to process that and make that available. But this is our free gift to you on Giving Day. So look for Father's Heart Ministry. Excuse me. He's doing good. It's called Preacher's Group. (laughs) He's keeping his voice. Uh, You can look for it on social media. It's on our website, propheticnow.com. 
And we also sent it out to the entire uh, subscribership via email as well. And <clears throat> and so it's exciting, all that's coming together, how God, you know, my mom always said, and I love her for that, she's in heaven, she said, if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. And uh, we are one of those families. We can accomplish a lot because God has graced us to be multitaskers. And so in Giving Day, I, I want to encourage you and give you the opportunity. I really believe in giving in the anointing. And I believe giving into the anointing needs to be done from revelatory inspiration. I just want to point you back to what we studied this week of when the prince would come in to the Restoration Temple. He was always required to come in the North Gate and go out by the North Gate, which represented the judgments of God. The prince had to come in seeking the judgments of God, and then he had to go out by the same gate, exemplifying the judgments of God before the people. But there was one instance where a prince could leave by the east gate, which was the king's gate. It was when he came in and brought a non-voluntary consecration offering, something that was over the top, that the priest would make note of. He says, hold on now, this is a little different what you would normally give because of your generosity Today, you don't go out the north gate. You get to go out the king's gate. And it's exactly what Solomon said in the book of Proverbs. It says, a man's gift will make room for him and bring him before kings. And that's literally what the east gate exit was all about. Don't tell me that uh, flipping a little coin in the offering plate that would insult a waitress uh, down at Denny's or giving a sacrificial offering does not make a difference uh, in the heart of God, just like Jesus that went to the to the um, measures of acknowledging the widow when she put in her two mites. And so I want to encourage you, giving is spiritual warfare. Kitty and I have known that for a long, long time. Whenever we've been under pressure, when we've been under assault, or when we've been moving into new areas of, of vision in our lives, we would always look and say, this is a time for some strategic giving? Are you wanting to move into transition? Are you wanting to see some things happen in your life? Giving, particularly giving in the anointing mm -hmm. under <laughs> revelatory inspiration, it causes money to move by the Spirit in your life. It, God told me it'll do two things. It will repair your personal economy and it will leverage you for increase. Do you need your personal economy to be repaired? Do you desire to see increase in that area of your life? Then I encourage you to ask the Father, what do you give? You ask the Father and listen to the first witness. The first witness is the amount that he's disposed, that the Father would be disposed to put his blessing upon. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray that every listener, God, as the anointing is present and that we can give into the anointing, that every listener would be prompted and have the follow-through, Father, to give as you have laid upon their heart and that they'd give cheerfully because they know they're entering into the commerce of the kingdom as you intended. It's how you intended for this to work. And so we thank you, Father, for listening ears. We thank you for willing hands. And we thank you for the furtherance of, of what we do that's made possible by the giving of obedient people. And we thank you, as well, our listeners. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And thank you, our listeners, Amen. for Appreciate being faithful to so give. Much. Be sure it's extremely important to us in your giving that you put in your memo or in your note in your giving something about morning light so that we can we can qualify the value of what we're doing, not in our perspective, but from the perspective of people that uh, appreciate morning light to the degree that they're willing to give toward it. Now, how do you do that? You go to propheticnow.com and click on the donation link. And there are two ways to give electronically. There are instructions there for people in countries that, that you can't do electronic giving, how to give uh, via Western Union. There are also, uh, there's a phone number. You can pick up the phone and call Terry Allen, our administrative assistant. You can call her during the broadcast and say, I want to give. And she can help you with that. And then there's a mailing address that you can fill out and lick a stamp and send your uh, gift in. I just want you to know how much we appreciate it. You know, there's not a dollar 
We've had people give 29 cents. You mm-hmm. think, oh, how insulting. Uh-uh. No, then you find out they did it from Kenya, yes. where 29 cents is you know more than what it is here in the United States. Amen. There's not any amount of money that comes into the ministry that we don't get a notification of it, and it's giving thanks because of your generosity. And for those, there are those that, that give, they give consistently. There are those that give liberally. There are those that have given over-the-top gifts that have just massively inva- advanced what we do. And, you know, we've made that a strategy in our lives. We're out there giving away from ourselves. We practice what we encourage others to do. Amen. It isn't like, I really believe, in, and I've seen coming up in pastoral culture many times, you know, the pastor is giving back into his own ministry. It's really important If you're in ministry, that you give away from yourself. That's right. And we do this consistently. Well, the church needs the money more. No, Mm -hmm. you don't understand. You have to give away from yourself. And you need to give in the character and in in the capacity that you desire those that support your ministry would give to you. Don't be small minded. Do not have the attitude as a giver and a church leader that you don't want the people that give into your ministry to have. You need to learn that money moves by the Spirit. And as you give liberally, as you give sacrificially, as you give consistently, God will cause you to be immersed in the commerce of the kingdom and the currency of the kingdom and the economy of the kingdom, and your life will be financially blessed according to a metric that isn't influenced by what's happening on Wall Street right. or in the Oval Office but it'll be influenced by what's happening at the throne of God. We could not survive ourselves if we had not learned that and if we did not practice that. So thank you again. And remember, go to the website, propheticnow.com, and click on the donation page, and there's all the information. You can do it on your mobile phone, or you can do, we have a mobile version of the website, or you can do it on your computer as well. And we just thank you for your generosity. Amen, Brother Precious. Amen. (laughs) And so today we're doing something different. I'm going to spring this on Kitty. Kitty gets to read the opening introduction of our Bible study. Well, how nice of you. Right there. Thank Um, you for that. Thank you for that. (laughs) Ezekiel 48, Territories and God. In this final chapter of Ezekiel, territories are described as divided among the 12 tribes in the restoration of the nation. The city of Jerusalem and all the temple... Uh, the temple, all to occur at the future time. It has been said that God is the ultimate territorial spirit, and he is concerned with dividing substance and jurisdiction among his people, which this chapter reflects. So, Kitty, if you would, <laughs> where do you want me to go to? Well, I'll tell you, why don't I just read the verses today? And you... <laughs> no, you better rest your voice. No, one. I won't do that. Kitty, if you would, read one verse through... 1 through 20. Okay. The final chapter of Ezekiel, we get to go to Daniel Monday morning. Woo-hoo. Yeah, we are making tracks, 1 through 20. Now these are the names of the tribes from the north end of the coast of the way of Hethlon, as as one goeth to Hamath and Hazarinan. Hazarinan. The border of Damascus, northward to the coast of Hamath. And these are his sides, east and west, a portion for Dan. By the border of Dan, from the east side up unto the west side, a portion of Asher, for Asher. And by the border of Asher, from the east side, even unto the west side, a portion of Naphtali. Now, for those of you that don't know, um, these uh, territories were given by a casting of lots. Some people say, what? Well, look at uh, Proverbs 16.33. It said, the lot is cast into the lap. The whole disposing is of the Lord. That means he uses whatever means he wants to, and it was a valid um, uh, valid as casting. It was valid then, and you ask the Father, what does that mean to me today? You know, we've actually, in the second church I pastored, uh-huh. as a young pastor, and I enjoyed uh, surprising my deacons. Mm-hmm. And there were several times that we had important decisions to make that we couldn't we couldn't just really know. There were so many different ways you could go. I said I would quote that scripture, mm-hmm. and we would put little pieces of paper in a in a uh, basket mm-hmm. with the different answers, right. and we would pull that answer. We say God's going to decide this one, and we'd pull it out. Made major decisions, land purchases, because we just trusted in the urim and the thumb and the, and the casting of the lot that made the decision. Right, and um, 
that scripture applies to today. You can seek the Lord and he'll make it clear. He'll make it plain. That's how our elections are settled. Man pulls the lever, but God decides the outcome. It's just another way of saying it. Okay, verse 4. And by the border of Naphtali, from the east side unto the west side, a portion for Manasseh. And by the border of Manasseh, from the east side unto the west side, a portion of Ephraim. And by the border of Ephraim to the east side, even unto the west side, a portion for Reuben. And by the border of Reuben, from the east side unto the west side, a portion portion for Judah. Now by the border, and by the border of Judah, from the east side up unto the west side, shall be the offering which you shall offer of five and twenty thousand reeds in breadth and in length as one of the other parts from the east and to the west side and the sanctuary shall be in the midst of it now your eyes just glaze over when you read this stuff but we're <laughs> going to make sense of it in a moment glory the oblation that you shall offer unto the lord shall be of five and twenty thousand in length and of ten thousand in breadth and for them even for the priests shall this be the, shall be this holy oblation toward the north five and twenty thousand in length and toward the west, 10,000 in breadth, toward the east, 10,000 in breadth, and uh, toward the fi- south, 5, 20,000 in length, and sanctuary of the Lord shall be in the midst thereof. It shall, I love that middle part. It shall be for the priests that are sanctified in the sons of the sons of Zadok, Zadok, which have kept my charge, which went not astray when the children of Israel went astray, as the Levites went astray. And this oblation of the land that is offered shall shall be unto them a thing most holy by the border of the Levites. And over against the border of the priests, the Levites shall have five and twenty thousand in length and ten thousand in breadth. All the length shall be five and twenty thousand and the breadth ten thousand. And they shall not sell of it, neither exchange nor alienate the first fruits of the land, for it is holy unto the Lord. And the five thousand that are left in the breath that over against the five and twenty thousand shall be a profane place for the city, for dwelling, for and for suburbs, and the city shall be in the midst thereof. And these shall be the measures thereof, the north side four thousand and five hundred, south side four thousand five hundred, east side four thousand five hundred, and the west side four thousand five hundred, you guessed it. And the suburbs of the city shall be toward the north, 250, and toward the south, 250, and toward the east, 250, and toward the west, 250. And the residue in the length over against the oblation of the holy portion shall be 10,000 eastward, 10,000 westward, and it shall be over against the oblation of the holy portion, and the increase thereof shall be for food unto them that serve the city. And they that serve the city shall serve it out of all the tribes of Israel. All the oblation shall be five and twenty thousand by five and twenty thousand. You shall offer the holy oblation four square in the possession of the city. So we see the territories laid out that are assigned to each tribe. And then the territory set aside where the city of Jerusalem would be found and the temple found therein. In this final chapter of Ezekiel, as the Father gives instruction to the prophet regarding the apportionment of land among the tribes for a time to come. It is interesting in the order in which the tribes are mentioned. As is customary in the Old Testament, Dan is mentioned first, and Judah is mentioned seventh. Dan is is the tribe connected with judgment. And in the Old Testament, from a perspective of prophetic mention, the tribe of Dan is almost always mentioned first because in the Old Covenant, man is presented with the law of sin and death presided over in judgment. But in the jewels of the breastplate of the high priest, if you look in Exodus 28, the jewel in the Old Testament mentioned first is Dan, which is the sardius stone, or otherwise known as the flesh stone. And in the Old Testament, Dan is mentioned first, in this chapter particularly. And then if you look at the stones of the breastplate of Aaron, you will see that the sardius stone is first, which is connected with the tribe of Dan, which represents the flesh because 
uh, it speaks of the law that could not justify man in that it was weak through the flesh, as Paul said in Romans 8, 3. However, in the New Testament, when you look at the listings of the stones, the order is different. Jasper is mentioned first, and if you look in the Old Testament, Jasper is connected with the tribe of Judah, therefore with a correlation to Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So, in, in, And in fact, in the Old Testament, and specifically in Revelation, the tribe of Dan, the mention of the Sardius stone, is excluded altogether. In other words, there's no place for the flesh in the New Covenant economy. And the jasper, which was the color of the throne, if you study mentions of the throne of God, there was an emerald rainbow around the throne, and it represents the glory of the tribe of Judah, and of course it's green, which is the color of, of life. Mm -hmm. He came that, not that we could have law and law more abundantly. We got a lot of religious law. Well, we can get rid of that. Mm -hmm. He didn't come that we might have law and law more abundantly. He came that we might have life and life more abundantly. If we were going to have law and law more abundantly, the rainbow, the bow of light around the throne would have been the color of a sardius stone or flesh. But it wasn't. It's the color of jasper, which is green. In the Old Covenant, mention of the stones, jasper is first, which is the flesh stone. Flesh comes first, and God's making a demand on the flesh. In the New Testament, however, we have life and life more abundantly. He's put a new heart and a new spirit on the inside of us, and it's, and it's the jasper that comes first. I studied these Immediately after, years ago, when God gave me the teaching on spiritual meteorology and understanding the mystery of the seven jet streams correlating to the seven spirits of God in Isaiah 11, 3, and immediately after that, I studied uh, all of these jewels in the scripture because Malachi says there's going to come a day God's going to make up his jewels. Mm -hmm. And I knew there was something there, and I studied it for months and couldn't get anywhere. And it was just like studying... Uh, the Seven Spirits of God relating to meteorology. I threw that meteorology book under the bed, and then God gave it to me. Well, it was years before God dropped in my heart this revelation that I've never written on about the sardius stone. Jewels are made by heat and pressure. So <laughs> why are you complaining about the heat and the pressure when you've been asking for the gold of God <laughs> in your life? You are one of God's jewels. And because he values you, he forms you through heat and through pressure into that stone, that living stone that uh, you are called uh, to be. And uh, so we see the stone representing Dan excluded in Revelation because James 2.13 tells us mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. And so we see the same thing. And looking at a map of these distributions, all of the apportionments mentioned of the first four patriarchs, the first four patriarchs mentioned in this list were all born to the handmaids of Rachel and Leah. They did not come directly out of their bodies. And the territories that they are given are the ones that are furthest from the sanctuary in Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? And as Kitty pointed out, these territories were not decided by some arbitrary process. They were decided by the casting of the Urim and the Thummim. And so we see that uh, Dan occupies the northernmost territory. God judges in the north. God sits in the north. God comes from the north in the Old Testament. Dan camped on the north side of the tabernacle of Moses. He was born to Rachel's maidservant Bilhah, Genesis thirty-five twenty-five. Asher, in verse 2, bordered with Dan. Asher was born to Leah's maidservant, Zilpah, Genesis thirty-five twenty-six. It's a, It's an understanding of uh, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Notice that Rachel's maidservant's uh, child, Dan, was put the furthest away, but, he, but yet Asher, who was born to Leah, who was not loved by Jacob, was allowed a closer place because that's how God operates. He prefers those that had been last and he makes them first. So it's of note that the tribes descended from Rachel and Leah's maidservants, however, were placed further away from the sanctuary, in fact, as far away from Jerusalem as they could be.
Then we have Reuben. Reuben was the firstborn. He's mentioned sixth in this list, yet he's the firstborn. His birthright was taken from him for having sexual relations with Jacob's concubine. Oh, that's a terrible thing. What can we learn from that? Have you ever heard a pastor say he's married to the church? You, know, you don't hear that quite so much anymore openly, but I remember growing up hearing that a lot in evangelical circles that the pastor is married to the church. Well, really? Well, why are you sleeping with your father's concubine? That's a Reuben spirit. Yeah. It's that whole attitude, and sometimes pastors and leaders, we do get this, fir- this elder brother mentality. How come you go tattling to God and complaining to God? How come you're letting these people get away with all that? Just like the firstborn complains about uh, what the younger children are getting away with. It's a Reuben uh, attitude. It's a Reubenite attitude that they adopt. We need to be really careful about the prerogatives we think that we as pastors have a right to take with the people of God. What you're doing, sir, is like in the days of the Bible, you're like a eunuch that is set to have the charge of the bride of the king. You better remember, you're messing with somebody else's bride. You're messing with somebody else's intended, somebody else's uh, a woman that's engaged to a bridegroom. And we better be very careful about, can you imagine if a bridegroom comes in and his best man is sitting there denigrating, yelling at, putting down, oppressing, pressuring, and manipulating the bride. I think the bridegroom might come up and give him a a black eye or a punch in the nose. I I think God takes umbrage, and the bridegroom takes umbrage at how leaders treat the bride. And I see that when guys get in the pulpit, and you see them railing and railing. And the perverse part of that is, is that the bride is out there in the congregation giving them a standing ovation for doing it. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the best man and the bride? And the best man is denigrating the bride, and the bride's clapping and jumping up and down. Yeah, do it again. Do it again. What is wrong with that picture? So, Reuben is sixth, which represents the number of man. Judah is seven, and the number, see, the number seven is actually a glyph of a number six with a crown put on its head. The number six is a vav, a V-A-V, uh, uh, that's the Hebrew letter for it. So we have Reuben, who should have been crowned, but because of his transgression, he is not. Instead, he is put as a second to Judah, and Judah is likewise a vav, with a crown on its head. And it speaks to us of Jesus and is the line of the tribe of Judah. And of course, Judah's mentioned seventh, and seven is the number of God's perfection. The Hebrew word for seven also means to cut. And the glyph is also a picture of a a man bent over at the waist, praying, a man praying. Uh, It's when Jesus, as the line of the tribe of Judah, went to the cross, he cut covenant between God and man, making salvation and the new birth available to whosoever will. Judah's territory, when you look at Judah's territory in this big map that God's showing Ezekiel, Judah was given the most prestigious plot of land, you know, beachfront, Mm -hmm. not not beach view, lake front, not lake view. Kitty and I know the difference between lake front and lake view and the price differential as well. Judah's territory was the most prestigious, bordering the central holy portion because it was given, uh, this tribe was given the messianic promise. In verse 9, there are instructions regarding oblations given in the midst of the measurements, reiterated from previous chapters regarding the sanctuary and the sanctuary ground. Now, this is mentioned here because the Levites were not given tribal lands, but the Lord was their portion. The Levites would live on grounds attached to the temple and would also live among the tribes as teaching priests. Remember, we talked about that, how that the tribes, uh, the Levites would come out from among the tribes on the first of the month 
and they would bring sacrificial blood and they would sanctify the tribes. They would sprinkle blood for the tribes and for their cities. It has to do with the ministry of the believer. It says, whomsoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whomsoever sins you retain, they are retained. Do you live in a wicked city? Do you live in a godless city? Do you live in a city where sin abounds? Well, you are there. One of your jobs is to go and remit the sins of your city. Amen. And we need to be thinking about that. We need to be praying about that. We want to sit back and claim the politicians aren't doing their job. Well, it's like we said, you're a king and a priest. Do your job. Amen. You know, get a placard and go, <laughs> go down to the church and jump up and down with a placard in front of the church saying, do your job, do your job. What's the job? To, in intercession, remit the sins of your city as a priest as outlined in the book of Ezekiel. Now, the family of Zadok is singled out of all the Levitical families with preferential treatment because in the days of King Zedekiah, the family of Zadok, from whom the uh, sect of the Sadducees, the Sadducees were actually, their name descends from the Zadokians, or those of the tribe of Zadok, had never given in to the idol worship that Zedekiah demanded the, the Levites perform in the holy place. They never did that, and therefore they're singled out. And then it makes the stipulation in verse 19 that this whole territory in the center of the nation doesn't just belong to one particular tribe. It belongs to all the 12 tribes. The precincts of the city of Jerusalem and the temple and the land itself belonged to all the tribes of Israel. And it's really interesting that when the kingdom was divided, the, the king in Samaria told the people, the ten northern tribes, you can't go down into Jerusalem because they didn't want them to worship in Jerusalem and then decide that the king in Samaria was no more king. What he was really saying is, you can't have your portion. It belonged to them, but the king in Samaria, for his own reason, says, you can't have that. You can't go down there. You can't have your portion. You get to have that when you're in heaven. You can't have that now. you got to stick in here with me and do what I say. Sound like anything you've heard once in a while? Really something to think about. Verse 20 through the end of the chapter, please. Uh, 21, I'm thinking. Okay, fine. <laughs> and the residue shall be for the prince on the one side and on the other side of the holy oblation. And of the possession of the city over against five and twenty thousand of the oblation toward the east border, and the westward over against five and twenty thousand toward the west border, and over against the portions for the prince, and it shall be the holy oblation, and the sanctuary of the house shall be in the midst thereof. Moreover, from the possession of the Levites, and from the possession of the city, being in the midst of that which is the princes, between the border of Judah and the border of Benjamin, shall be for the prince. As for the rest of the tribes, from the east side unto the west side, Benjamin shall have a portion, and by the border of Benjamin, from the east side unto the west side, Simeon shall have a portion. And by the border of Simeon, from the east side unto the west side, Issachar a portion. And by the border of Issachar, from the east side to the west side, Zebulon a portion. And by the border of Zebulon, from the east side upward unto the west side, Gad a portion. And by the border of Gad at the south side, and the border shall be even from Tamar unto the waters of strife at Kadesh, and the river toward the great sea, to that river. This is the land which shall divide. you shall divide by lot unto the tribes of Israel for inheritance. And these are their portions, saith the Lord God. And these are the goings out of the city of the north side, four thousand and five hundred measures. And the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel, three gates northward, one gate of Reuben, one gate of Judah, one gate of Levi. And at the east side, 4,503 gates, and one gate of Joseph, one gate of Benjamin, one gate of Dan. And at the south side, 4,500 measures and three gates, one side of Simeon, one gate of Issachar, one gate of Zebulon. At the west side, for 4,500 4, with their three gates, one gate of Gad, one of Asher, and one gate of Naphtali. It was round about 18,000 measures, and the name, uh, the name of the city from that day shall be, The Lord is there. Wow. So in verses 30 through 35, the 12 gates of the city are described, and their relation to the 12 tribes of the people of Israel. 
the northern gates were assigned to Reuben, Judah, and Levi. The eastern gates were assigned to Joseph, Benjamin, and Dan. The southern gates were assigned to Simeon, Issachar, and Zebulon. The western gates were assigned to Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. These are the final specifications given to Ezekiel regarding the restored city of Jerusalem and the Restoration Temple from chapters 40 to 48 of the final chapters of the book of Ezekiel, ending with the pronouncement that the Lord is there, this great decisive word concerning the holy city, which is the compound name of God, Jehovah Shammah, meaning emphatically that the Lord is there. And we just close with the remembrance that this is the shadow of which the church is the substance. The church is the heavenly Jerusalem, the mother of us all. And guess what? There are tribes in God. There are tribes in God. And uh, because there, you realize that when the ten tribes went into captivity approximately 200 years before Ezekiel's time, that they bred themselves out of existence. And you say, well, God knows who they are. Well, au contraire, because when we're talking about these tribes, we're talking about uh, the old covenant and the dictates of the law. And when someone, even if you intermarried between tribes, to have to be of stock that was not pure, both tribally pure, not just not marrying a Gentile, but marrying in between tribes to have uh, mixed blood tribally under the law was to be of no tribe at all. And so when we're talking, and we're not advocating what that might seem to suggest to you, but the point being is these tribes disqualified themselves And so we must realize that that is a shadow of which the church is the substance, and that tells me that there are tribes in God. One of the things, just one small part of that, is what we've seen where we've had an inordinate number of people connected with our ministry from the medical field. And we have never sought to do that. We've never tried to to garner that or make that happen, but we just laugh. We'll we'll get people that we communicate with and interact with. Well, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm an RN, or I'm a a, doctor, (laughs) doctor, or I'm a this, or I'm a that, something related to the matter. We just laugh because God's God's doing something there. God's Mm -hmm. saying something, and it's interesting because the last job Kitty had outside of full-time ministry was managing a medical practice, a speech pathology practice, pathology practice for a friend of ours Mm -hmm. and so there are tribes in God I tell people all the time I said you are seeking the prophetic because you are prophetic and you just know many of you that have been so faithful to be a part of morning light ministry you're you're a part of our tribe we speak the same language God's drawn us together and there are blessings that are accrued, accruing to us because we have accepted and we're developing that tribal identity in God of which you are a part. And part of that is territory. God wants you to have territory. God is the ultimate territorial spirit. He gives us jurisdiction. He gives us territory. I believe God wants every man, woman, and child to be a landowner to have property, and not just to have property, but to have abundant property, and not just something that has a mortgage on it you're going to be paying on till your grandchildren are old. I'm talking about something that's yours, something that belongs to you, that's the gift of God, and represents what he wants to give you. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and he desires to put it in the hands of his people. So we thank you, Father, that we belong to the tribe of Judah. Jesus, being the Lion of the tribe of Judah, we thank you that we are grafted in, and we thank you that you are a God of decency and order. And there's so much more we're going to learn from the order that you have placed in your word. We thank you from Genesis all the way through to Revelation that we're getting stuff that we didn't have before. We appreciate um, the expanding of the knowledge of the word of the Lord to us. And we bless you, Father. We bless our listeners today. We bless every morning light listener, our family out there, with a beautiful weekend. In Jesus' name, amen.